Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, we've spent the day discussing how to promote uh, new forms of private sector engagement in responding to the urgent needs of tens of millions of refugees and vulnerable migrants. We've identified examples of how to tap into the knowledge, skills, and innovative spirit of the private sector, and how the private sector is moving from simple philanthropy to engaged corporate activism. These new approaches are necessary if we're in we are going to help refugees move from dependence to self-reliance and to provide support to refugee hosting areas around the world. In this concluding call to action session, we want to draw attention to significant plans and projects announced here today and to start to think about next steps in rebuilding refugees' lives and in restoring communities. We'll hear brief remarks uh, first from Kathleen Newland, Senior Fellow and Co-Founder of the Migration Policy Institute. Salil Shetty, uh, to my uh, far right, who is Secretary General of Amnesty International. Salim Salama, Director of the Palestinian League for Human Rights in Syria. And Gregory Maniatis. So Kathleen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alex. As you know, the focus of this meeting was on action not declarations of principles or even elaboration of strategies, but on what to do next and what to do now. Given the very short time we have, I'm going to try to give just one example from each of the substantive discussions that we had today. And I apologize for all the really good ideas that are not going to get an airing here, but they will get an airing in subsequent uh, reports. So from our session on philanthropy, um, the emphasis what we heard from corporations about going beyond the usual corporate social responsibility to build on their core business models to create social value that can also turn into uh, profitable, sustainable ventures. From our session on connectivity, people talked about taking advantage of the low marginal costs of technology today to connect more and more, to connect virtually all refugees with access to information, uh, knowledge of where to get services, and so forth. The panel on private sector engagement with refugee resettlement, uh, we heard a presentation of a, a very interesting Canadian initiative in a multi-stakeholder partnership with the Soros Fund and with UNHCR to assist countries that are interested in learning from the Canadian model of private sponsorship of refugees. And at that same session, we also heard from a US official about a serious intention to develop a pilot project on private, spon private sponsorship for the United States with substantive input from US NGOs and from the Canadians. Take them up on that offer. We heard in a session on refugee matching about sophistic a sophisticated new method to assess refugees' characteristics and skills and match them with countries and communities in which they can thrive by using those skills. And in private investment for refugees, uh, we heard not only about incentivizing private investment in refugee hosting areas, but also an, some very sophisticated ways of removing the disincentives for investment in crisis areas by um, pooling risks, by using insurance, and, and so on. And our final session on changing the narrative, people emphasized how important it is to humanize refugees by telling their stories, but also to tell the stories of the people and the communities that welcome them. The lesson from that session was ultimately, it's not just about who they are, it's about who we are. Thanks, Alex. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Salil. Thank you. Um, Unfortunately, on the other side of the road at the United Nations, uh, yesterday when there was the high-level summit of leaders, um, from Amnesty International's perspective, what we had was a spectacular and collective failure to deliver anything substantive for the 21 million refugees. We didn't see any sense of urgency or any sense of humanity coming out of that meeting. Thousands have died already. 
uh, trying to cross the Mediterranean and other uh, journeys to, to, to uh, safer places. Millions are in desperate need and are in huge uncertainty. Uh, but uh, what do leaders come up with? Empty words, hot air, not a single new or measurable binding target at the end of this meeting. As you know, half of the 20 million, over 10 million people live in 10 countries, which, uh, and they're living in appalling poverty. Um, what are these countries going to go back with? Pretty much nothing. The richest countries host the fewest refugees and do the least. And there is no question that if governments want to do something, they can. It's only 0.3% of the world's population. So the idea that we cannot do anything is simply not true. We've ended up now postponing the global compact by two more years, um, a postponement which cannot be borne by the suffering people. So as far as Amnesty International is concerned, this is a meeting which is looking at practical actions and calls to action. We have put forward five very concrete proposals on how the situation can be changed. And essentially, it's a proposal of global responsibility sharing based on the size, the uh, economic capacity of countries. We cannot let the poorest countries and the most difficult neighboring countries alone deal with the problem, whether it's resettlement uh, or financing. What we have proposed is a system that's predictable, uh, not ad hoc, and not crushing the neighboring countries. Uh, the second point I wanted to make is that the richest countries normally say that the main problem is the political cost of accepting refugees is too high. Uh, in our view, this is simply not true. All the surveys we've done shows that two-thirds of the population in most of these countries, once they understand what is on the table, they do welcome refugees. There is a third which are very vocal who are against it, but it, and we've seen that in countries like Germany and Canada, where the leaders have stood up for the issue, public opinion has shifted or you know, leadership has shown that you can shift the discourse. Um, unfortunately, in some countries, if you take countries like Australia or Hungary, we've seen the opposite, shocking behavior by the leaders. Just to give you two practical things, the Australian taxpayer currently has to pay about seven billion US dollars to stop people from arriving on the Australian shores. It's almost $400,000 being spent per refugee to keep them out. Uh, the Hungarian government has spent $16 million to keep 1,300 refugees out through an extremely divisive um, propaganda campaign. So world leaders have failed us, but I'm glad that citizens and the private sector are not failing us. Uh, as far as Amnesty is concerned, uh, we are launching a campaign called I Welcome Refugees, and we welcome uh, private sector partners who uh, themselves subscribe to human rights values to join us in this. Um, we are very excited by many of the things which have come out from this meeting today. Uh, but of course, the reality is that um, it only kind of shows how badly governments have failed that now we have to rely on individual corporate or private initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Salil. Salim? Uh, hello, I'm very happy to be with you today. Uh, my name is Salim Salami, a Syrian-Palestinian activist, researcher, and advisor to Ban Ki-moon on youth peace and security, but also a political refugee in Sweden. Um, I survived the war in Syria. I'm very lucky, I'm one of the luckiest to be sitting with you today here, and very happy that Syria and refugees are taking a central theme in your discussion. We are calling this a refugee crisis, but I would like to reframe it and say that this is really a crisis of leadership. A crisis of leadership because the, the, the world leaders and the international community did really fail us. Hopefully the private sector won't fail us. On this note, this room is full of influential people, of people who can change the status quo. And um, I'm here with, in a delegation of four Syrian experts. We've been traveling in the US for the past nine days. And we, we, we are trying to remind everybody, and especially the policymakers, and in this case, the private sector, of the three important facts about what's going on in Syria. First and foremost, this is a, a crisis that has root causes, political root causes, that we need to address sooner or later. We look forward a proactive uh, and, and firm American leadership to solve this, uh, the root causes of this crisis and an involvement of the private sector because we really need you guys. But also we need to include Syrian voices in, the, in our discussions. I'm very happy to be sitting here today, but I, I, would been, I would have been happier to see more faces as well involved in this conversation. 
And last but not least, we really need to, uh, to adopt holistic approaches, holistic approaches that uh, can be inspired from the, the innovation and the leadership of the, of the, of the public sector, uh, because in the reconstruction of Syria, we will need all efforts to be involved. And when international politics and international leaders have failed, we really hope that we can inspire a little bit from the leadership in your sector, in the private sector, in the philanthropy sector. And we look forward to uh, a greater involvement. We extend our hands as, as Syrian experts, as Syrian diaspora, for you guys. And, and we are here to be uh, along the way with you, with you in this collaboration. Thanks a lot for the Open Society Foundation to have me, and thanks a lot for uh, Concordia Summit. Thank you so much. Gregory? Thank you, uh, Alex. Thank you, everyone, who has made today possible. Uh, we've had a very rich discussion. And I would only, I think, end with a single thought to take away from the day. Obviously, the reason we're here is the suffering of refugees um, and the need to reduce that suffering. And we've talked a lot about that. But if I were to take away one idea from today, that, that's been echoed, I think, by a couple of my fellow speakers, is that this moment and this crisis is about us. It is obviously about the suffering of refugees, as I said, but it is about us. It is an x-ray into where we are in 2016 as societies, as democracies, as individuals. And as individuals, all of you, all of us, if you're a journalist, if you are a business leader, if you are just an average person like Chris and Regina Contrambone, who have rescued through their own means, 27,000 people in the Mediterranean to give you a sense of the measure of the, the possible. It is up to us to act, and it is up to us to act not only to help others, but to help ourselves. This is our legacy. This is our time on Earth. We have to do better than we have in order to live in societies that our children and grandchildren will look back and say, I'm proud to be part of that legacy. Thank you, Gregory. What Salil has said reminds me of the well-known phrase about the urgency of now. And Salim and uh, Gregory have both talked about how people in this room and people you know and people who know people you know uh, together uh, can make a huge, uh, a huge difference. The emergencies are crucial. There are also tens of millions of displaced people in long-term uh, situations of displacement. We have to undertake activity to help those people as well. We heard a lot today about possibilities of private investment and private sponsorship of resettlement, other avenues of work that all of us can contribute to through our knowledge, through our skills, uh, and through our connections. So I want to uh, extend my thanks to Concordia for putting on this uh, wonderful day of, uh, of rich discussion. We are not going to stop here. We're going to carry forward on a number of the initiatives that were identified today and drive those home until they make a difference uh, in the world. Thank you, panel, for being here. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Nick uh, Logothetis, the co-founder and chairman of the Board of Concordia. Thanks, everyone. And Nick, um, Nick, can we also thank you again and your staff and also our staff, Maggie and Kato and Lucretia, who have done an incredible job of putting this on. Thank you very much. Everyone worked very hard, and, and um, I'm so proud of what we did today uh, with the migration session. Um, as I said downstairs, tomorrow, or right now, is, is not the end, it's the beginning. And from here, uh, Concordia will endeavor uh, greatly to turn what we've discussed here and in other places into action. That's, that's the type of organi organization we are seeking to become, an action-oriented one. And so it all starts here, um, and, and tomorrow morning we get to work. So that concludes our summit today. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. And on behalf of Matt and myself, we'll see you all next year. Thank you. <laughs>